This week, I'm talking to Christina Tobin of Free and Equal about the two-party duopoly, the way they rig the system against third-party candidates, and what we can do to stop the game and demand change. Check it out. Christina, finally we meet in person. Um, I want to start with you just telling us a little bit about about what you do. Christina Tobin at Free and Equal, you've been sort of a ballot access guru fighting for third parties to get involved in politics, um, maybe since you were 13 is what I heard, but your entire life. Um, and. And this is an interesting time to talk about this because we were in the midst of, of what appears to be a complete insider coronation of Kamala Harris. I'm, I don't know if she's ultimately the candidate for the Democrats or not, but, but we went from defending democracy to backroom deals where suddenly the Democrats have a candidate. Um, but in the midst of all this, we can't get um, competition any third party voices, left, right, center, libertarian, conservative, like it, it seems to be a completely closed system. And this is what you've been working on, I think, your entire life. Give us a little bit, bit of background. Yeah, when I was 13, my father, Jim Tobin, uh, ran for 45 years National Taxpayers United of America. So I grew up around, I remember one of my first meetings with this, was Grover Norquist. And next thing I know, a couple of years later, there's these stacks of petitions. It seems like up to the ceiling, you know, when you're yay high. Um, when my father introduced me to Paul Jacob and they were doing an initiative on term limits. So my father sponsored, supported, financed, and Paul Jacob, you know, ballot access is what he does, uh, a master as a master. And so in 98, when my father ran, he decided to run for governor at the peak of his career as a libertarian third party, I like to say alternative party candidate. And I saw firsthand the uh, flaws of the ballot access, the restrictive ballot access barriers of, of what it took for a third party, alternative party candidate to get on the ballot in Illinois, took five times more signatures, 25,000 signatures versus only 5,000 uh, for, that is 5,000, 25 for the third parties versus 5,000 for Democrats and Republicans. And so uh, my dad was recommended by the hearing officer to be placed on the ballot and the State Board of Elections wrongfully decided to knock him off the ballot because he was a threat to the system. And so my dad sued the State Board of Elections directly out of pocket. He did not prevail. It went to the Illinois Supreme Court. It was a million dollar uh, case, huge. And when he lost, uh, election law expert, ballot access expert, ally, friend, hero, Richard Winger called me the silver lining of 98 because I was about 17 years of age and I was mad. You know, I was angry, more emotional, younger, like how? But me mad, it's like, oh, I'm mad. But <laughs> And so four years later, my, my dad ran for lieutenant governor. I stepped in to not only gather 5,000 signatures, holding five clipboards at a time, uh, but also became his ballot access coordinator and got him on the ballot for lieutenant governor. So that was a spark in the beginning beginning of a ballot access in that world. And I uh, definitely, for about a decade, devoted my life helping get not only third parties on the, on the ballot, that is, but also Democrats, Republicans, independent candidates. Yeah, so, so one, of the, one of the big barriers to entry, like every, everyone's always asking when they look at, at ballots, uh, president, but all the way down the ticket, why don't, why don't we have better choices? And, and so much of it is sort of this... Um, um, process-based um, prohibiting of, of third-party candidates to even compete. Let's talk about ballot access. It, it's different in every state, but it's quite typical that Republicans and Democrats either have no barrier to getting on the ballot or, or some very simple barrier to, to gather ballots. Um, is, is, it, is that true in every state? And, and why is it structured so that third parties can't get on? Well, in 2004, when I got my dad on the ballot, a, a gentleman, or 2000, it was 2000 actually, uh, forget the years when he ran lieutenant governor, um, this independent candidate 
by the name of Ralph Nader. Uh, he contacted me in 2004, and I became his statewide coordinator defending signatures. And then four years later, I was hired as the National Ballot Access Coordinator for Independent Ralph Nader. So I have firsthand seen the restrictive ballot access barriers. Can you imagine? I went from like a road trip coordinator at the beginning of 2008, just came back from Bali, Indonesia. I'd lived there for three and a half years and, uh, and, and or after. I lose track of time. But um, yeah, I think I left for Bali. When did I leave for Bali? Yeah, was, I had just come back and Nader uh, decided to hire me as a state coordinator. A month later, I became the National Ballot Access coordinator. So independents have to get over 938,000 signatures to get on the ballot as an independent. Back in 2008, they had lots of different rules. Like um, I would, you could see photos of me if you look deep within uh, in research of sitting at the state capitol of Chicago and binding petitions because if you have one staple on the petition, uh, they'll knock all of the uh, signatures off, off the ballot. They'll knock the candidate off the ballot. My father, for example, 98, turned in over 60,000 signatures. The requirement was 25,000. And there was one fraudulent circulator that maybe had a thousand or two. They decided to make them all, you know, they didn't all count because there was one fraudulent signature. So uh, the rules uh, are very extensive and it is extremely rigged uh, for outsider candidates, uh, third party independent candidates, people that are not beholden to the powers that be in big money. Uh, when you become a threat, they use ballot access to knock you off the ballot, you know, they, they use those rules. There's no coincidence uh, when I worked within the Chicago Board of Elections, I was one of the few people defending candidates, accountable candidates, and had a miraculously winning record. There's this guy that ran for Senate. And I was like, who is this guy? Because every single competitor, everyone that ran against him, they knocked off the ballot. I had never seen anything like this in 10 years. I was like, they're gonna run this guy for president one day, Barack Obama, and they did. Yeah. So he he knew how to play the game. Well, the did he know how to? Beat you. Yeah, it's like yeah, I should correct myself. Did he know how to play the game, or did, did the powers that be cho cho choose him as the guy, and then they just started rearranging the rules appropriately? Yeah, mutual, probably both. Yeah, yeah. They chose each other. Is, is there anything about the American system that insists that we have two parties, or is this just the two parties that have gotten control? over the years um once they get inside they they re keep moving the goalposts and rewriting the rules so that they, they they just don't want competition there's few people in office i completely trust uh, i can say two right now uh, dr ron paul and representative thomas massey and uh so, from, solid choices i mean you know that's these are two men that just have not compromised whatsoever in a moment and they're in their own the league of their own and uh and we've heard from dr paul it's a business behind the scenes they're all friends they're all allies and they're all beholden to the same money um, massey coming out nationally about apac and the babysitters of the d's and r's alike is a uh, true and these are the things that we are going to change as the new paradigm rises and that's a whole nother topic i can address but um yeah the two-party system's a business uh independents are intentionally when i say independent whether you're alternative party third party independent candidate you're independent when you're not beholden to the powers that be when you make your own choices like dr paul and massey have uh, paved the way uh and so uh when you're independent of the system uh you know you um when you are not independent, that is, as far as a two-party system, um, you're beholden to the powers that be. You can't make much change, and that's what we're here at Free and Equal Elections uh, working to do yeah. uh, on a national, federal, and, and local level. I definitely want to get into federal, that. I definitely want to get into that, but I want to just touch one more point on ballot access because I know this mostly as as someone like we did a super PAC for Gary Johnson in 2016 after after Rand Paul pulled out of the uh, Republican primary and and I've been a big L libertarian ever since um, and you discover very quickly that all of their resources all of their energy is spent on just getting on the ballot and I feel like the LP you you probably know this better than me but the LP probably is does the best in terms of actually just having uh, close to 50 state ballot access but that's all they get to do and 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 they get if they get to 50 then they're like wiped out of money exhausted and their candidate whoever it is has no money resources to actually try to get on the debate stage and we, we can talk about that in a minute but um are 
is this this has to be true for the Green Party. I assume it's true for RFK Jr. now, who's obviously raising a lot more money than than the libertarians are. But so much of the energy goes not into just ballot access, but the legal battles to make sure that the ballot access you get actually is not torn away from you. Yes. Um, as of today, I'm the only person to have successfully get an independent on the ballot that's in the industry, 45 states plus D.C. I achieved for Nader in 08. Uh, we didn't have enough money for all 50 states. It takes upwards of 10 to 15, even 20 million, depending on when you start a ballot drive. For example, as an independent, as, as February, you have to do Utah's the first deadline. Um, you have to begin then. And you're right. It, uh, it completely drains the campaign. It becomes a distraction. I have my petitioning company, Free and Equal Inc. This year, we were hired by Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Super PAC to do a few states. Uh, it transitioned to where the campaign ended up uh, doing it all for legality reasons. Um, but I've also helped the Jill Stein and Gary Johnson in 2016 in a lot of states. Uh, the ba ballot access coordinator for Green Party, Rick Lass, said he wished he hired me for all 50 states. This is what I love doing. I love helping candidates across the spectrum get on the ballot. So I am uh, shifting myself in a direction and a business to be able to uh, piggyback and do two, three, five different drives in 2028 to get these sort of candidates on the ballot. Why? So they can actually run the campaigns, uh, you know, and focus on the campaigns and focus getting into the debates. And uh, because the camp, the, the ballot access drives completely um, absorb. Even Donald Trump, when he first ran for president, is not commonly know, known, reached out to Richard Winger and said, what would it take to get on the ballot as an independent? So that tells me right there, he clearly used, I'm not surprised, but he clearly really use the Republican line to get elected and good on him, you know, arguably uh, Massey and others too. Um, this is what we have to do right now. But in the future, an independent movement will help support these candidates where they don't have to use party lines. But uh, yeah, Trump reached out and uh, in Creed and it came to me and my petition company. And um, he realized that uh, because he was and is a threat to the system, they would knock him off the ballot as an independent, just like the DNC is attempting to do for Kennedy the cycle. Regular viewers of Kibbe on Liberty already know how obsessed I have been with the pandemic industrial complex and all of the stupid authoritarian and downright evil things that the government did to us during COVID-19. Well, I'm proud to announce a new investigative series that looks to get to the bottom of all of that. It's called The Cover Up, and I'm producing it in cooperation with Blaze TV. The only place you're going to see this is Blaze TV. So go to FauciCoverup.com slash Kibbe and use the code FAUCILIED for $30 off your annual subscription. Do it now. The truth is out there. Yeah, thinking about the uh, uniparty, the duopoly, the cartel, whatever you want to call it, uh, you know, the, the cabal of insiders that that really hate independent thinking candidates. Um, and, and in my lifetime, the four most interesting candidates, you mentioned one of them, Ron Paul, um, ran within the Republican Party and, and, and used the Republican primary as a, as a kind of a cultural platform to talk about ideas, very disruptive ideas. Um, and Donald Trump in a different way, an outsider, um, kind of an influencer before social media was such a big thing as today. But on the Democratic side as well, um, either look at, well, I guess I could add Bernie, but I was thinking about Tulsi Gabbard and um, who else was I thinking about? Um, RFK Jr., who, who was, of course, a Democrat until recently. Um, the system doesn't like independence. Um, and all of these guys in different ways were, were kneecapped. I mean, I, I, I was at the RNC convention when the Ron Paul delegates were, were deplatformed because um, the Romney machine didn't want any dissent. It, it, was, it, was, it was stupid. It was performative. It was alienating to those voters. And, and this, is, this happened again and again and again. Um, can independent-minded people perform within the system or do you do you need to sort of break the duopoly and and allow for an independent to run i think what we're going to need to see is a movement a truly independent movement outside of the current flawed two-party system powers that be of uh, form and and rise and two to three percent of the population when they get 
back an idea, as Dr. Paul and many others have said, when an idea comes, nothing's going to get in its way. There's going to be art and music and energy and frequency and uh, thought leaders, and they're going to inspire and spark people to run for office. We're going to be seeking the kind of people that are not looking to run for office, but are going to be asked by their community and their constituents to run for office on a local and all level. So as that paradigm builds uh, beautifully, and technology is a game changer, there's going to be a lot of uh, the decentralized blockchain aspect into it as well and transparency. Uh, but as that rises, we're going to see, uh, starting with Congress in 2026, most if not every member of Congress, excluding Massey and a few others, uh, they're going to be replaced with a whole bunch of Masseys. I mean, you know, kind of these are, well, left to right independence really is where I'm at. I see yeah. beyond the party cycle. So um, that's what I see happening. The old paradigm, Congress, average age, 70, probably 80, 90 soon, um, that's going to organically die off. Um, and we come from a place of free and equal elections, from a place of the Martin Luther King, the nonviolent, uh, love is greater than fear place. And uh, that's how we're going to reform our electoral system. It's it's the only way to do it. Um, it, it, does, it doesn't work any other way. No. Um, we met um, in the, the lead up to uh, Freedom Fest, yes. and and I've been I've been running some of the interviews that I did at Freedom Fest um, on my show. I had a lot of great conversations, um, and and I had not heard of your organization, but but I want to talk about what happened at Freedom Fest and what your model is for platforming debates that the Uniparty won't allow. Yes, it was in 2008 after serving as Nader's ballot access coordinator, he put on this rally, it was called Open the Debates Rally, and he taught me the corruption of the Commission on Presidential Debates. It was like this light bulb went off. I remember when he said at the DNC, it was him and I, the one time we had that one-on-one -on -one time together, he looked at every member of the press at the DNC and he said, Christina, I could interview with every member of the press here at the DNC right now and I wouldn't reach but three to 5% of the population of what the Commission on Presidential Debates reaches. And Jesse Ventura uh, opened at that Open the Debates rally talking about how getting into the debate debates that's how he won as a governor of minnesota and tom morello jamming out to uh seegers or uh or G guthrie's uh, this land is your land and um the original lyrics and that was the spark of the creation of my nonprofit in 2008 so that's 16 years ago now and uh, free and equal elections when we hosted the first nationally televised debate at that time outside of the Commission on Presidential Debates. Ralph Nader, independent, was there, and Chuck Baldwin, Constitution Party. It was not easy to get those two behind the scenes to, 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 to join and to be a part of the debate. The most difficult part in putting on debates is getting candidates there. Uh, so Chris Hedges came in and, and moderated it, Pulitzer, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist. And then four years later, Larry King and I co-moderated Free and Equals presidential debate yeah, 2012, reaching tens of millions, if not more. So fast forward to the Freedom Fest debate. Is that, is that available online now? It is. Okay. Uh, it was on Rumble. I've been told it's airing on C-SPAN this week, and we have a lot more media. Our next debate, we're about to announce the date, uh, location, this September for our fourth presidential debate of the series. Yeah. It'll take place this September. I want to tell you about this new brand that we love here at Free the People. Our friend Jennifer Say, free speech warrior and truth teller, has started her own athletic clothing brand. It's called XXXY Athletics, and it is the only athletic brand standing up for women's sports. We met Jen when she spoke out against the insanity of COVID lockdowns and school closures and stood up for our freedoms. She risked her reputation to do the right thing, and she's doing it again now. A lot of other brands out there claim to champion women, but only Jen actually does it with her new brand, XXXY Athletics. As a former elite gymnast, she was the 1986 national champion. She knows the importance of protecting Title IX. And as the former Levi's brand press president, she knows a thing or two about great products. XXXY Athletics just launched their performance wear for both men and women, including cool t-shirts, bike shorts, and leggings. So check it out at xx-xyathletics.com or thetruthfits.com. Don't give your money to athletic brands who don't share your values. Give it to a brand that speaks truth, stands up for free speech, and puts quality first. 
Use the code KIBBY75 and you'll get free shipping with orders of $75 or more. Finally, an athletic brand with a cause you can get behind. Go show XXXY Athletics some love. Wear the truth out loud. Go to xx-xyathletics.com and use the code KIBBY75. That's K-I-B-B-E-7-5 to order. Do it now. Let's talk about the difficulty of, of getting in an actual open debate. And, and I, you know, the, at Freedom Fest, RFK Jr. did in fact show up for the second year to um, talk to Freedom Fest. But my, my sense is he didn't want to actually debate. And this is like, this is an ongoing, it's a fundamental dilemma. If, if, if you're a candidate that has, let's, I mean, RFK seems to be polling at 15 plus percent, um, more than enough that he would legitimately been allowed on the actual Republican Democrat debate. Um, but he doesn't want to debate people that aren't even pulling at 1% because it, it actually elevates those candidates. How would you actually get all of the candidates to participate in something like this? It has to be such a, a culturally powerful event that they can't say no, right? Our presidential debate series is, is bigger than the debates. It's the beginning of an independent movement that's brewing. Um, we're going to break out after our fifth debate. We're planning the fourth in September, fifth in October. We'll be breaking out to the United We Stand tour. So I saw you at Freedom Fest in the back room, green room. I wanted to say having Representative Thomas Massey co-moderate our, our debate this July, given his uh, personal circumstances, what a, what a hero, what a leader. Uh, I've had this difficulty since 2008. Uh, the first debate I had originally booked at Dominican University University. I had every press outlet you could ever imagine across the U.S. confirmed. I had one problem. I had no candidates that would confirm because Bob Barr, Libertarian, only wanted to debate Ralph Nader, and Ralph Nader only wanted to do a debate with Bob Barr. And so it canceled, and um, yeah. it, it, I was suddenly the fake debate. Uh, but there were internal things of, of Ralph making things right because uh, things were wrong. I'll put it in a book one day in the details. But he made things right by doing that debate with Baldwin four days later. Yeah. And so I've had that continuous struggle, even with Gary Johnson and Jill Stein. They were amazing in our 2012 debate. But in 2016, uh, sometimes they get a, a little little bigger. And um, you got to realize in this cycle, the way that Trump and Biden treated Kennedy is exactly like how Kennedy is treating Jill Stein and Chase Oliver. And I think a real president, a real leader, and maybe he'll see it come September, uh, has got to realize, yeah, maybe they'll come up in the polls a few percentages, but can you imagine if Kennedy was at our debate, how many more voters from the whole pools of individuals uh, would be attracted to Kennedy because of him uniting for a much bigger movement than one campaign, a truly independent movement. So we'll break through that. I don't give up. I'm relentless. Ralph Nader's even told me, you don't give up. Most people give up at first base, you keep going. Yeah. And I'll keep going until they're all there. Yeah, there's like there is this uh, um, the paradigm shift, and and Trump is the beginning of this, even though it, he doesn't quite fit the model. But uh, I think RFK more closely fits it. I think the reason his campaign is performing, outperforming, you know, historical efforts by independents is his willingness to have conversations like this. It's not it's not a canned speech. It's not talking points, um, and and that paradigm I think I think supports the direction you're going in, because at some point voters are going to want to hear an actual conversation. It it like debates maybe are problematic if people are trying to score points against the other guys, but you know could you have authentic candidates actually having conversations about actual issues that would be so radically different than what we do today? It's all performative. It's all. Um, just uh, the other guy sucks, so vote for me kind of dynamics. But, but it strikes me that the influencers that will take over politics are actually willing to engage their opponents in a real conversation. I hope. Maybe I'm being naive. 
I mean, um, there's also influencers within the campaigns. Nader had particularly one or two that uh, caused a wedge of him not being at the debate at Dominican. And Kennedy has that as well. You have people that just have agendas because politics attracts that. And I'm sure Trump, his first cycle, he became a, you know even more wise, now his second and so on, uh, of who he surrounds himself with. So I commend Kennedy doing the best he can. Uh, but he did endorse free and equal elections last year. And he wrote me in a text, I guess I'll be at your debate and even offer to reach out to Joe Rogan to moderate, and then something changed, Some, something shifted. He said there were people on his team advising him not to do this. I was like, oh, Bobby, but it's his choice to change his mind, and that's the free freedom of choice. And uh, But uh, I did book him as a speaker. That was my doing behind the scenes at Freedom Fest, 30 minutes prior to our debate, hoping he would be at the debate, but also accepting the fact that he may not. And it was mutually beneficial no matter. And I also booked Dr. Cornell West to speak Saturday. And and I hope that he'll be in the debate in September. Uh, he spoke Saturday at Freedom Fest. He'll be a keynote speaker there next year. And Freedom Fest is already interested in having one of the stops of the United We Stand tour there next year. So um, that'll be exciting. And uh, Cornell West, uh, I hope, will be a keynote. So. Uh, I'm really here to um, see beyond the agendas of campaigns, and I stick with the heart and uh, who Bobby is, and I'm so grateful that he's running for president, and I'm so grateful for what he has done, as well as many others, from Ross Perot to Anderson to uh, Dr. Paul and, and, and so on, who have really paved the way for something bigger than yeah. one individual, one campaign. Yeah, like I... I, I... I went back and, and did a little bit of research on this because when we were doing a Gary Johnson um, super PAC, it was pretty obvious that Gary Johnson should have qualified for the main stage. He be, should have been included in that debate, but the uh, Presidential Debate Commission, controlled by Republicans and Democrats, kept moving the goalpost from the days when, you know, when Ross Perot, I guess it was a League of Women voters that, that ultimately let Ross Perot on the stage. But then the parties complained so much they didn't allow him the second time, even though he had garnered like 19% of the vote. So ever since Ross Perot, the party keeps shifting the goalpost so that, that we're never going to let that happen again because that was too disruptive. Um, so I, I don't. Think and even even this year, like the, the, it was not the Presidential Debate Commission, but clearly the corporate media is exactly the same thing. They just kept moving the goalpost so that RFK couldn't possibly qualify, even though he obviously did. It, there was there was no question about the fact that he should have been on there. Um, it's got to be done from the outside, and I I think. I'm not even sure what the question is here because you're you're just going to repeat what you just said. Like we're we're gonna we're gonna break the system, um, but we're not going to do it this year. I don't think. I've learned to not be attached to a timeline anymore. It's a journey, not a race. A little bit of a race, but I mean it's a journey. I'm in it for the long haul. So this year, great. Uh, 2028, uh, more likely. 2026 congressional races are key. And, um, you know, my point before I wanted to finish on the debates was um, the difficulty of putting on the debates in 2012. I had Gary Johnson, Jill Stein at that debate, but in 2016, they wouldn't participate in Free and Equals presidential debate. And they did a debate between just the two of them themselves. And our slogan's more voices, more choices. And they started the debate with two voices, two choices. I was like, wow, you know, like this is just the politics. It was really undeserving. Right. And um, Jill Stein's made it right. You know, she got aligned with an agenda, a guy, David Cobb. Uh, I knew from Nader that he was uh, just not a personality that was like-minded about Jill. And she's been at our debates uh, all this year, and it's wonderful she's come around. And, and I think uh, all the candidates will over time. But I, again, I, I stay on the focus of the solution and uniting and, and seeing beyond politics and party lines and, and individuals and independents. Um, there are, as most of your viewers know, more independent voters than there are Democrats and Republicans and uh, free and equal elections. When I saw, when 2008, with Nader and the debates rally, I knew the history of Ross Perot, that they rigged the system to keep Can Tulsi Gabbard. They kept her out of the debate because she was becoming a threat. They're not going to let, likely, uh, Robert F. Kennedy in. There's a reason nobody else has been in the debate since Ross Perot, which was also an inspiration to create free and equal elections, presidential debates, because I knew one day corruption, you know, tainted platforms like the Commission on Presidential Debates, they don't last. 
they eventually crumble and yeah. it has crumbled. And uh, I knew there need to be an alternative mainstream, truly independent debate to rise. And we're here at the forefront of achieving that. Yeah. Thank you for joining me today on Kibbe on Liberty and for being part of our fiercely independent audience. Every week, my organization, Free the People, partners with Blaze TV to bring you this show. My guests bring smart perspectives on everything from current events to timeless philosophical debates. If you like what you hear, go to freethepeople.org slash KOL and support Kibbe on Liberty so we can continue to produce these honest conversations with interesting people. Now, let's get back to it. The, the, the enemy is the handlers, right? The, the political class, the operatives who aren't necessarily just working for the guy that they're currently working for. They're working for the system because that's where they'll get their next, their next job. And they, they seem to have a, an incredible skill in, in ruining candidates. They start telling them, oh, you can't have that conversation. You can't debate that guy. You can't say those things that you've been saying before. And I think people, uh, particularly young people, the reason they like Ron Paul to this day is that there is no handler. There's no, like, he has no, like, talking points. Thomas Massey, I think, is is basically a younger version of Ron Paul in that sense. There's no handlers. There's no talking points. Um, they're smart enough to talk about whatever issue is raised, and they're comfortable actually thinking out loud um, because they have a set of principles that, that sort of guides their, their thinking, even on things that they might not fully understand. That's got to be the future. Um, but by the way, it's uh, you mentioned Tulsi Gabbard, um, RFK Jr. RFK Jr. gave a speech at Porkfest, where the New Hampshire libertarians so. gather. The most libertarian speech I've ever given. Now, obviously, RFK understood his audience, and he was he was trying to appeal to them. Um, Tulsi Gabbard also, like in particular, her her views on war are, are quite libertarian, her views on censorship, her willingness to even oppose a TikTok ban. It, like, these are, um, there's a libertarian streak in all of these outsider candidates that I see. And I think, I think that's probably the reason that they're excluded. Um, the fear is that there's a different way of thinking about the world, which isn't about power and money and, and violence, it's about cooperation. Um, is that part of it too? I've, I've found when I, um, you know, when I worked for Nader with ballot access in 08, uh, I piggybacked, meaning I would help get the libertarians on the ballot in states where we were allowed to carry for more than one presidential line, party, or combine. And as the Nader Raiders, as we call the circulators for the, the kids, uh, doing it on a, a, a really great budget for the campaign for Nader and would hang out with the libertarian circulators were very knowledgeable. I mean, these are the professionals been at 20, 30 years. After they hung out together three, four, five weeks, every single one of the Nader Raiders like shifted libertarian. It was fascinating to yeah. like. So there's a lot of a beautiful emotion and heart on the left side. There's mm -hmm. a lot of logic on the right tends to, to not as have as much emotion heart. So it's beautiful to see that come together. But um, you think libertarians should have more emotion and heart? Really? Uh, yeah, I think that, uh, I don't know about more, but I think there's a balance between the left and the right. I think a, a bit more of logic, uh, left, you know, right, sure. heart could really bring us together. I do. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of, but every situation's different. That's not overall. I mean, that's just a, maybe a majority of what I see. And, uh, but. The, no, it's, it's real. <laughs> right, right. So, okay. Um, and so we can, and we do agree on more uh, things than not. Mm -hmm. And the system intentionally focuses on these divisive issues, abortion, guns you know climate change control and it's just like uh there are every other topic from across the board like we can really unite on and i think the big thing we can agree on is reforming not only the electoral system but uh, our entire government uh really being able to put things on a ledger uh blockchain seems to be the best thing now i think there's gonna be even greater things in the future that we can utilize to bring transparency within our elections and shift the power from the federal state to even local level I used to um, give a talk um, arguing that Ron Paul and Bernie Sanders had more in common than, than people would appreciate. And it was inspired by, in 2016, I went to both the, you know, thank God I don't do this anymore, but I went to the Republican National Convention and the Democratic National Convention and, and the LP Convention. 
Um, but I met um, one of Bernie's delegates just hanging out in the hallway, and it was it was right before that that dramatic um, exit by Bernie when he had sort of been kneecapped by Hillary Clinton's machine. But I was talking to her, and she was from Vermont, and and she had um, she covered with political buttons and and one of them was uh, something to the effect of def- defend the second amendment and so i started talking to her about this somewhere i have a video interview with her and and she was 100 percent behind bernie but when i talked to her about issues um it turns out she was a libertarian but she she had never actually heard that word before and hadn't really framed her worldview in that way so i think Um, I think it would be a mistake, to your point, it would be a mistake to write off people that are rallying around Ralph Nader, rallying around Bernie Sanders, uh, rallying around RFK Jr. with their sort of anti-crony capitalism, anti-corporatism thing. That that is, in fact, a very libertarian position. So I I think there is a coalition of sort of anti-authoritarians that are coming from all over the political spectrum. And yes... Bernie Bros and Ron Paulers could, in fact, cooperate on a number of things. I mean, what sets Dr. Paul and Massey apart from the rest is, uh, and many, is uh, they didn't endorse any of the powers that be candidates when they, if they were pressured to endorse Romney, Paul's like, no, I'm not going to. And Massey, like, even the other day, I met him, I met with him at his office on the day uh, Netanyahu spoke, right? The Capitol uh, two days ago, I think, on yeah. protests. It was really, I was like, oh my gosh, how am I going to get through these barricades? But we did. And uh, he didn't want to be there to hear him speak. And I got to meet with him instead. I mean, that that's true leadership, that's purity. And those are the sort of individuals. Also, they led within their community and they didn't abandon their communities. That is important. Your community, Kentucky, I talk about you know different you know, people in Congress there and focusing on the positive Massey, they love him because he did not abandon them. He is still there for them. And um, those are the kind of people that we're gonna see uh, getting elected for Congress in 2026. But yes, as far as the viewpoints uh, across the spectrum, I mean, I grew up around a libertarian household with my father and uh, but I've always been an independent and I see all the ideas independently but yeah as I've seen left and right come together in the petitioning world it's, it's kind of interesting to see that uh, I think uh, logic does prevail but it's not my role as a moderator and founder of free and equal elections to say this is what we should do this is what we should do my role is to bring the ideas and the conversation together and that's what sets our debates different from the others is that I tell all the candidates no personal attacks. You can go after the idea and critique the idea, but respect one another, you know, come from a place of respect and compassion. Yeah. And to date, they've all listened to that. And when we have that dialogue and that conversation beyond the debate series this year and breaking out to the United We Stand tour, um, we're going to see solutions rise. And we have a blockchain voting app that we launched in February for our second debate of the series this year. There were over three, 400,000 votes casted that voted in the top seven candidates to be invited to our debate in February because there were over 1,500 people running for president. And who am I to set a criteria? Of, I'm like, let's just let the people vote via ranked choice voting. And um, they chose the top seven candidates. And I think four of them came of the seven. Uh, Kennedy and Cornell did not make it to that. Um, in July, our criteria was you're on the ballot in enough states to be viably electable or receive 2% in a poll. Um, so I, I hope Cornell and Kennedy can make it to our September debate. I think Cornell will do it. I hope so. I really like him and his uh, wife, Anahita, after spending hours with them at Freedom Fest. And, um, but I agree with you. I'm excited to see, uh, let the best idea win. Uh, but we got to have a platform where we can have that compassion, that conversation, which brings about the solutions. Yeah, I mean, I, um, I, I never hide where I'm coming from, but I, I very much believe in, to me, that's democracy, and it has nothing to do with um, one person, one vote. It's, it's about a true exchange of ideas where everybody's voice actually matters, and you're having an honest conversation. I, I think our ideas about, about peaceful cooperation actually emerge in that that true democratic competition um and to me that looks like like libertarian it i mean it's a very romantic view and i think um you know we've we've laid out all of the barriers that that might prevent it from happening but but as we wrap up and maybe you have a couple other things you want to bring up but i'm going to suggest that we start a draft thomas massey for president campaign here and he's going to kill us for it 
because he doesn't want to do it. I mean, it's, um, but I feel like we should. It's a big deal to, um, you know, his big concern is I don't want to lose my congressional seat. And he cares about the people in Kentucky. So when the people of Kentucky say, Massey, we want you to run for president. And when the supporters come, that's a big reason uh, indirectly. I was at his office the other day because I feel the same way. I hope he and many others run for president in 2028. Um, but I think that he is uh, someone that could definitely win in 2028 and would resonate with the masses, not only within the United States, but throughout the world, uh, because uh, he is a, a carbon semi copy of Dr. Ron Paul and younger, 53, I think now. And uh, for him to show up at the president, presidential debate uh, a couple weeks ago, I think July 12th, uh, several weeks after, uh, is, is after losing his beautiful you know, best friend, his wife, Rhonda. Uh, um, who does that? Only Massey. I mean, to yeah. say Rhonda would want him to be there gave me chills um, when we paid respect to that during the debate. I, I was prepared for him not to be there. Uh, but I also felt if anybody was still going to show up, it'd be Mr. Massey. And he did. And so um, what a leader. And uh, I, I know in his heart, I feel it that Rhonda would want him to do that. <laughs> I can't put the yeah. words of it. I can feel it, whether it's a debate or run for president. That's his choice. But um, I think he's going to make a, a huge change, and he's going to be one of uh, many keynote speakers we're going to be inviting to be a part of the United We Stand Tour 25 and 26. So um, people can watch that debate uh, co-moderated by Thomas Massey. I think it's on Civil as well, C-I-V-L, yes. which, is, which is a new emerging platform, and they, they, they publish a lot of our work as well. Um, but it, it's definitely worth watching. You can see candidates that you're not going to be allowed to see anywhere else, perhaps. Um, how do people uh, find you and get involved in Free and Equal? Yes, they can go to freeandequal.org. And so people can actually, we're, we're launching and, and breaking out our blockchain app to where we're gonna implement polling into it so people can poll and, and list all the candidates into that app. These are third parties, independent candidates. And so I urge you to go on freeandequal.org to get linked into being a part of the voting process on a decentralized blockchain app uh, where there's transparency, right, and solutions. And you can go to freeandequal.org uh, for more information. That's a way to get involved, uh, to, to vote through your phone uh, as we build out that app for the years and decades to come. Blockchain voting will decentralize, will transform our elections and bring about political transparency. And the game changer we have here have at Free and Equal Elections in this cycle, this pivotal time in history, is technology. Technology again, is the game saver. And we don't need to go through these needless, vicious cycles of chaos every 30, 50, 60 years. It's a game. Mm -hmm. It's a grand illusion, uh, as Teresa Motto uh, authored the book, Grand Illusion, Myth of Voter Choice and a Two-Party Tyranny. Uh, that's a book she wrote back in, I think, 2008, 2010. And James Bennett, a uh, libertarian Cato Institute, uh, you know, how demo publicans have rigged the system and left independents out in the cold. And uh, so this is what we're doing at Free and Equal Elections. So you can go to our website and support us, freeandequal.org. And I welcome Free the People to be a part of the journey of the series and, of course, the United We Stand Tour. And Matt Kavi, thank you so much for all that you've done to make our world a better place. And you're going to be doing a lot more in the future. Thank you. Thank you for this conversation. Thanks for watching. If you liked the conversation, make sure to like the video, subscribe, and also ring the bell for notifications. And if you want to know more about Free the People, go to freethepeople.org.